Innsmouth is a fictional town created by Howard Phillips Lovecraft, a writer from Providence that lived between 1819 and 1937. He wrote mainly horror, science fiction and weird fiction novels, while also initiating a philosophical movement called Cosmicism. He became widely known mostly through his creation of the Cthulhu mythology. During his life, his work only reached a small group of people. However, after his death, his work began to enjoy a new renaissance. Novels, movies, TV series, comic books, games and many many more were all inspired by his work. But this video is not specifically about him. Shadow over Innsmouth is one of H.P. Lovecraft's best stories. The title are Innsmouth is a declining seaport town in New England. Its xenophobic, deformed and degenerate residents were followers of a mysterious pagan cult of the sea god Dagon. They also interbred with an ancient race living in the oceans called the Deep Ones. Shadow over Innsmouth is my personal favorite horror short story and I revisit it quite often. It had such an impression on me when I first read it that I still have an indescribable affection for it. It haunts me and fascinates me. This video is my tribute to this work. This will be a really big project and I'm going to gather here all the detailed information regarding the history of the city, its inhabitants and all the Deep One schools worldwide. There is a lot of content because fortunately the whole story doesn't end on that single tale. What Lovecraft had left was later expanded by other creators, such as August Derlet, Brian Lumley, Matthew Davenport, Basil Cooper, Alan Moore, Stuart Gordon and many many others. Another major related story is Dagon, written in 1917 by H.P. Lovecraft, which was the first tale to introduce the Deep Ones in the mythology. It wasn't until 14 years later, in 1931, when the author revisited his theme in the iconic Shadow over Innsmouth. In 1933, he also wrote The Thing on the Doorstep, a short story revolving around a strange woman from Innsmouth that can be recognized as a side story here. I consider these three stories to be the most significant, as they are the closest to the source, which was the H.P. Lovecraft himself. I will also cover these stories first. Innsmouth is located at an estuary of the Manuxet River into the Atlantic Ocean. Because of the surrounding waters, marshes and hills, the town has always been geographically separated from the rest of the world. Despite this, there is still a road from Arkham in Newburyport, as well as bus connection. In the past, a side railroad from Rowley also led to the town. A bizarre black rock formation, known as the Devil Reef, can be seen standing out of the sea, about two and a half kilometers from the town's coastline. Behind the Devil Reef lies a very deep oceanic trench. The town of Innsmouth was founded in 1643 and soon became a prosperous and growing port town known primarily for shipbuilding. Fishing and lobster fishing were also an important part of the residents' life and income. By 1812, the town had experienced its greatest growth. It was extensive and densely built. At that time, factories were established, industry and commerce grew, and hydroelectric power plant was built, using energy from the Manuxet River. It was after the War of 1812, in which many people died, that Innsmouth began to decline. Trades collapsed, factories were closed, and fishing became less plentiful. After the Depression, only Captain Obed Marsh led long-distance trading expeditions across the South Pacific Ocean. He had three ships at his disposal, Columbia, Hetty and Sumatra Queen. It was during these expeditions, which took place in the 1820s and 1830s, that Obed made trade connection with the Kanak people that lived in the island to the east of Tahiti. One of its tribes was a rather strange-looking community that wore unusual gold jewelry and worshipped terrifying sea gods. Also, the waters were full of fish. At first, Obed had only acquired this strange gold from them and brought it to Innsmouth, where he found a refinery for further gold purification. Later, he also became intrigued by the customs and belief of the Kanak people on the island. Their leader, Valakia, taught him the ceremonies and prayers so that the sea gods, called the Deep Ones, would respond. In exchange for sacrifices of young people, the gods gave wealth, food and eternal life, which is basically everything that humans desire. As it turned out, humans are related to them, so by interbreeding, hybrid offspring will be born, that can live forever in the seas, just like the deep ones. 
1837, Captain Obed Marsh, after returning to Innsmouth, made first contact with the deep ones living in the ancient underwater city of E. Huntley beyond the Davy Reef. In 1838, in 1838, the peculiar Kanak tribe vanished without a trace, leaving Captain Obed and his crew without trade connections or access to their cheap gold. As he returned to Innsmouth, which was falling into decay, and its citizens faced hunger and poverty, Obed started to call on the people to change their old beliefs to the ones that provide real benefits. He wanted the locals to worship the deep ones, just like the Kanak people. In return, they would be given this weird gold and sea full of fish. The promises obviously lured some of the people of Innsmouth, so Obed made further connections with the deep ones living in Ilhant Lane. Along with his henchmen, he began to perform regular ceremonies on the Devil Reef, as he had learned from the Canucks. The captain and his crew started to get rich. Other Innsmouth residents also got better. The refinery went on full swing, and fish catches were so plentiful that they were being sold to Newburyport, Arkham and Boston. A side railroad connecting Innsmouth and Rowley was also opened. The newly founded esoteric order of Dagon superseded existing religions and took over the Masonic Lodge as its headquarters. Their most important festivals fell on April 30 and October 31st. At the same time, young people began to disappear in the city. Matt Elliot, the first officer on Obed ships, who assisted him on his expeditions, was against the new order, but he also vanished soon after. The same thing happened to the people who publicly supported him. In 1846, Obed and his 32 men were arrested. A young Zadok Allen, who saw one of the Order of Dagon ceremonies on the Devil Reef, informed the people of Innsmouth, which didn't like the new rules, as they decided to take things in their own hands. A few weeks later, the massacre of the people of Innsmouth happened. The sacrifice hungry deep ones of Inhant Lay freed Captain Obed and slaughtered all the people who did not support him. As a result, half of the population of Innsmouth was killed. In 1846, Obed took a second wife, Ptihiali. She was a deep one, and he had three children with her, all hybrids. This was the time of complete submission of the people of Innsmouth to Obed Marsh and the cult of the deep ones, which began interbreeding with humans. The remaining citizens were forced to take the oaths of Dagon, in exchange for that exotic gold, protection and various rewards. The first oath was an oath of secrecy, the second an oath of loyalty, and the third was to marry Deep One and raise a hybrid child to be born in the aftermatch. From that point on, Innsmouth became town close to the outside world, with a population of no more than 400. People lived grim, secretive lives, afraid to let their terrible secret come to light. No one cared about keeping trade connections with other town in the area anymore. In fact, people no longer cared about anything so the city fell into a state of disrepair. Ceremonies were still being performed in the esoteric of Dagon temples and on the Devil Reef. The Deep Ones regularly invaded the surviving inhabitants and were bringing something secretly to the city. Between 1863 and 1865, during the American Civil War, military units were stationed in the Innsmouth, so the situation in the town improved seemingly. The absence of the half of the residents, slowly in 1864, was explained by an epidemic. Every effort was also made to avoid raising the suspicion of outsiders. After the war, things only got worse in the city. Moreover, children born after 1846 began to grow up and show the first signs of their transformation. In Smouts, four more prominent and influential families, the Marshes, Waits, Elliots and Gilmans, lived in even greater isolation than the rest. Locked away in their mansions, they rarely showed themselves in public. There was a general aversion to the people of Innsmouth in the neighborhood towns. There were also rumors about their strange looks, their skin disease, dealings with the devil, strange jewelry, and marsh fortunes. In 1873, the Newburyport Historical Society put on display one example of Innsmouth exotic jewelry. A tiara purchased for a small amount of money from a drunken resident of the town. Another well-known specimen is also found at the Miskatonic University. In 1878, Captain Obed Marsh died. However, he left behind numerous offspring. He had four children with his first wife. His son, Onesaphirus Marsh, married a deep one. And their son, Barnabas Marsh, is a hybrid. 
Obed's second wife, Khtheali, was a deep one. He had three children with her, all of them hybrids. His daughter, Alice Marsh, went to Europe and married a man from Arkham, Benjamin Orn. Therefore, starting a line of marshes living outside of Innsmouth and unaware of their dark heritage. Khtheali returned to Ihantlay after Obed's death. Once in a while, outsiders have appeared in the history of Innsmouth. There were a few Polish and Portuguese people that tried to settle in town but were effectively forced out. An inspector named Casey, who was visiting the town, spent one sleepless and frightening night at the Gilman house and then hurriedly left at dawn. A careful young man from Arkham also works at the local grocery store. The most notorious incident, however, was the arrival of Robert Olmsted the unsuspecting great-great-grandson of Obed Marsh and Pthiali. Robert Lomstead came to Innsmouth on July 15, 1927, during his tour across the New England. The play he found was grim, ruined and deserted. Three tall Gregorian-style towers loomed over the city. The roofs collapsed, the roads blurred, the rails overgrown and the telegraph poles leaned wireless. The ship harbor, surrounded by stone breakwater, was in decay, almost completely buried by sand. All that remained of the lighthouse was the foundations. Boats and lobster's nets were scattered everywhere on the coast. A few wooden farmhouses on the outskirts of Innsmouth had shuttered windows and dirty courtyards. Closer to the center, the housing became more dense and buildings were made of brick and wood. There were a few cars, also the roads were in better condition here. In the center, there was a gothic church occupied by esoteric order of Dagon, the Gilman house, a store, a restaurant, a drugstore, the office of the Marsh Refinery, and all residential buildings. The Marsh Refinery, now operated by Barnabas Marsh, stood at the mouth of the Manuxet River into the ocean. During his walk, Robert Olmsted never saw more than a few people, mostly young, but already with the traces of Innsmouth heritage. All of these people looked at him suspiciously. He never really heard them speak to each other. All the time he had the feeling of being watched, even in the deserted parts of the town. He heard strange noises coming from abandoned buildings. There was the smell of fish everywhere and no pets at all. Robert was highly intrigued by the town and its mysterious story, so he was asking anyone he could about the Innsmouth, including the young shopkeeper and the old drinker Zadok Allen. It was Zadok that told him the true stories of Innsmouth, Capitan Obed Marsh and the Deep Ones. Probably, if he had stopped there, Robert could have left the town without any further difficulties, but Zadok in a burst of drunken courage told him about the Shoggoths and the Deep Ones' preparations for something. From that moment on, everything went crazy. Zadok's sudden escape, broken bus, spending the night in the shabby Gilman house, the strange sounds in the hallway, the attempt to break into his room and escape through the window. Almost all citizens of Innsmouth, even Barnabas Marsh among them, set in pursuit of Robert. Soon the Deep Ones' horde also joined the chase. The next day, July 16, 1927, Robert managed to escape from Innsmouth. He immediately reported the entire incident to authorities, which began preparations to launch an attack at this community. In the winter of 1927 to 1928, the federal government conducted a secret investigation of Innsmouth. As a result, the police made massive raids and arrests, also blowing up the abandoned buildings in the town. An underwater ship of the Navy fired torpedoes into the depths beyond the Devil Reef. The hunt lay was damaged, but not destroyed. The entire action was subtly muted. Those arrested were not formally charged, no trials was held, and their whereabouts were unknown. After the events of Innsmouth, Robert Olmsted tried to lead a normal life. However, he soon uncovered the truth about his heritage. In the winter of late 1930s and early 1931, he started having dreams of undersea wonders, cyclopean cities, and life among the deep ones. From that point on, his inevitable transformation into one of them began. His views changed as well. Robert now intends to free his cousin Lawrence from the insane asylum so they can live together for eternity in Ihantley. H.P. Lovecraft based the town of Innsmouth on his impression from visiting the Newburyport. It is also believed that he was influenced by two short stories, The Harbour Master by Robert W. Chambers and Fish Head by Irvina S. Cobb which he prints in his letters. Shadow over Innsmouth was the writer-only novel published in the form of small book during his lifetime. 
Lovecraft was not particularly happy with the effect as despite its low price it sold only half of the printed copies and contained many editing errors. Shadow over in Smout was one of the first H.P. Lovecraft stories that I read while still in high school. I think it was a solid introduction to his work. It's a bit different from his other popular short stories which feature horror on the more cosmic scale. Here the horror is more physical. It surrounds the main character and is within himself. This place has a, such an atmosphere, and Lovecraft captures it perfectly. A seaside town in decline, where the inhabitants live in the secret conspiracy against the whole world. There is no future here. Everything is falling apart, people don't care anymore. Visitors are not welcome here. You always feel that you are being watched. You hear the sounds in seemingly empty houses, and you have the impression that everyone is talking about you. You don't want to get paranoid, so you tell yourself it's only your imagination. Then suddenly, you hear someone trying to enter your room while you're sleeping. At that moment, all your worst fears materialized, and you already know it wasn't just your imagination. Something is physically treating your life, and you have to run away. I think the biggest nightmare of the people from Innsmouth is that they don't belong in our world anymore. They themselves are victims here, and they regret what Obed Marsh did. They can't fight it, so they have to submit. They are just waiting for their transformation to complete, so they can go underwater, which scares them at first, but also fascinates them. Eventually they realize they can't escape their heritage and must join the Deep Ones just like Robert Olmsted did. Those who won't join like Sadok Allen are living without prospects, drinking to forget the horrors that have happened. This also is horrible in its own way. The Deep Ones tempt people with wealth and immortality. At first, this may seem like a good thing, but the Deep Ones are increasingly intruding the lives of the community. They implement their rules, demand obedience and sacrifices. The cosmic horror begins when we realize that there is an ancient undersea civilization that could destroy humanity if they wanted to. They possess greater knowledge, the power unknown to us. We don't know their goals and motivations. We are irrelevant to them. In conclusion, the story Shadow over his mouth has all these factors I appreciate in a good horror tale. There is an interesting story with insinuation, a gradual suspense and the proper mood. There is an isolated town with a secret, hostile residence, strange rituals and cosmic horror. There is an endangered paranoia and sinister conspiracy. It triggers the feeling of isolation and hopelessness in the reader. Dagon is the short story that started everything. It was Lovecraft's introduction to Deep One's mythology and the nucleus of the tale he later expanded in so much detail. Dagon tells the story of a named protagonist who, escaping from captivity at the beginning of World War I, awakens in an unknown land in search for rescue. The time and place of event can be roughly placed around 1914, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Which is interesting, because Captain Obed Marsh from Shadow over Innsmouth encountered a tribe of Kanaks, also somewhere in the South Pacific Ocean. Desperate, exhausted and full of worries, the protagonist began a long trek across the swampy land while being tormented by bizarre dreams. He finally reached a great monolithic block, beyond which the endless dark ocean unfolded. The monolith was an object of worship for sentient beings and portrayed the ancient deep ones during a number of ceremonies. Some of them, apparently, seem to be as big as whales. While the protagonist was examining the block, the massive deep one emerged from the water, approached the monolith, embraced it and bowed its head. During the delirious escape of the half-conscious protagonist, a great storm broke out. He was found in the middle of Pacific Ocean in his boat. Soon afterwards, seeking solitude, he fell into the trap of morphine addiction and committed suicide. The story leaves a lot of room for doubt whether what the narrator described really happened or was just an hallucination produced by his exhausted and frightened mind. It is impossible for such a huge area of the ocean bottom to rise naturally to the surface, even in matter of days. I assume that either there must have been other supernatural forces at work or everything never really happened. It is also worth mentioning that the Dagon of the title it's not necessarily the same Dagon as the one worshipped by esoteric order of Dagon in Innsmouth. The story suggests, rather, that it is simply a title from mythology used by the narrator to name the exceptionally large deep one. Dagon is short but effective story. 
it introduces us to the world of cosmic horror, showing us how gruesome the implication of gaining forbidden knowledge could be. The mere realization that humanity was not the first intelligent race on Earth, and that we are insignificant on the cosmic scale, can be unbearable. Many people would rather never know about it, and those who do know must seek oblivion in alcohol and drugs. It's a bleak vision, true to the trend of cosmicism originated by Lovecraft. Another H.P. Lovecraft story related to Innsmouth is the thing on the doorstep. It is in a way a side story to it, connecting both tales with the person of Ethan Atwaid, of the Waits family from Innsmouth. It also makes many references to the grim history of the town and its people. The accurate timing of the story in the context of the event of Shadow over Innsmouth is problematic, but it does hint one important date. 1850s as the time of the horrible bargains between humans and the deep ones. However, nothing is mentioned about the raids and arrests in Innsmouth from 1927 to 1928, which would suggest that the story ended before it. Despite the secrecy of these operations, residents of the surrounding towns, including Arkham, should at least know some basic information about it, assuming it already happened. If I had to specify the most believable time frame in which the thing on the doorstep took place, I would say it was between 1850s and 1927. The thing on the doorstep is the story of Edward Pickman Derby, who married an Innsmouth born Deep One hybrid of Senat Wade. The Waits were one of the Innsmouth's most prominent and influential families. Her father, Ephraim, was an old and very powerful sorcerer and occultist. Studying the Necronomicon, he mastered the ability to transfer his consciousness into another's body and take it over, even permanently. He desired eternal life, and for that he required an immortal body. He knew he was running out of time, so he struck a bargain with the Deep Ones and married one of them at the end of his life. Ephraim wanted a son, since he believed that the male element had greater potential and could achieve far more in the arcane arts than the females. He also knew that the child born by mating with the Deep Ones would be immortal. He only had to take over its body in time, so he himself would never die. However, it was a daughter, a Senat Wave, who was born. Having no choice, he took over her body when she was a teenager. Before this, he ingested the poison himself, which in effect killed a Senat Mind trapped in his dying body. The rest of the story describes the several years of Edwin Pickman Derby and Asenath Wade's relationship as they got married and began their life together in Arkham. For their honeymoon, they chose the most romantic place in New England, Innsmouth, from which they brought various books and occult artifacts. They also hired three old servants from Innsmouth, the elderly couple, Moses and Abigail Sergeant, and the younger girl, Eunice Babson who was later revealed to be a member of Ephraim Wade's cult. Over the next several years, Ephraim, in the body of Asenath Wade, controlled, manipulated and repeatedly took over Derby's body. During this time, Derby also studied the esoteric knowledge that would help him protect himself from Asenath further attacks. He learned the secret of Asenath's identity and realized that it was Ephraim's consciousness that was pulling the strings. Ephraim, while in Edward's body for increasingly longer time, traveled and performed occult rituals. In the middle of one of them, Edward regained control of his body and saw the Shogod's den deep underground in Maine. This is interesting in the context of Innsmouth history, as the Deep Ones living in the town was also planning something related to Shogod's. Simplifying the ending, Edward killed Asenath in an act of desperation, but that didn't stop Ephraim from finally taking over his body. Not even that could stop him. Edward's consciousness was forever trapped in a Senat corpse, becoming the titular The Thing on the Doorstep, while Ephraim gained complete control over the body that he so desired. Wade's success did not last long, however, as he died at the hands of the story narrator. Within the context of Innsmouth, in The Thing on the Doorstep, there are several facts that enrich the plot. For example, the two servants mentioned earlier, Moses and Abigail Sergeant, were probably related to Innsmouth bus driver, Joe Sergeant. The Gilman family, which owns the Gilman house in Innsmouth, was also mentioned in the story. Family members heard the screams of pain and terror of Asenath Wade dying in Ephraim's body. It can be implied that they were disturbed when they heard it, so it is possible that the Gilmans back then were not yet following the new order imposed by Obed Marsh in 1846. This cannot be said about the Marshes and Wades, who by then were already interbreeding with the Deep Ones. 
The thing on the doorstep is an okay story. In fact, I like it, and not only because of the insmote lore. However, I feel that the narration from Edward Pickman Derby point of view could have been more effective. The biggest horror in the story is the realization of losing your own identity and control over your own body. The outside watcher only saw the changes in Derby's behavior while Derby was experiencing full nightmare.